So, Ron, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Peter. Hi, all, welcome uh, to this webinar of the Model Driven Data Warehouse with Case Talk and Dataful Builder. Um, my name is uh, Ron van Braam. I'm Chief Technology Officer of Trusum. Um, I recently uh, joined this, uh, this club, uh, building on uh, the data management and uh, BI unit. Uh, in the past 10 years, I guided uh, several data warehouse implementation with Datafold. And in those years, I, I became a strong believer of semantic and uh, business conceptual modeling. So uh, 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 the language first, and along the way, I did some model-driven architectures. So that's exactly the topic of uh, today. So um, uh, very welcome uh, to this webinar. Um, I'm just a warmer. Uh, we have uh, two more presenters. Uh, the first one is uh, Marco Wogan from uh, Case Talk. And the second one is uh, Peter uh, Bellis from, um, uh, from Datafold Builder. So Marco, can you uh, give a short introduction of yourself? Uh, sure, very short. Um, yeah, well, as you said, my name is Marco. Um, I'm the lead developer of the product Case Talk, and um, it's it started on the shoulders of theoretical research in the Netherlands in the 90s, and has been a product on the market for now for almost 20 years. Um, and um, it involves uh, support for information modeling using factorized <coughs> modeling. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, but you want me to start my, my presentation instantly, or you want to introduce Peter first? Uh, Peter first, please. Good. So my name is Peter Bellis. I'm working in the data warehousing area. I started as developer since the year 2000. I started in, in financial companies here in Zurich, mainly a big commercial bank, more building like Inman style data warehouses in a big team. I switched over to telecommunications back in 2006, was leading the data management team there. We did more style of Kimball style reporting, data integration, and back in 2012, I came across certain challenges with agility in data warehousing that we couldn't solve anymore with classical data modeling. So we switched over to data vault modeling. And I'm as well a strong believer that it should start with the business model, that we should talk first about what is the target. And I'm really happy that we have Marco here on the call because he's representing really this kind of thinking that Let's talk about what we really need to do, what are the definitions, and then technology comes later. I will come for the second part in how we take a data model and generate it into some working code. Yeah, thank you. Um, <coughs> be, be, before we go to Mark's presentation, I have still some slides uh, just to warm up because I want to take you on, on my journey. Um, it's, it's a kind of time lapse. Uh, um, what I already said, uh, 10 years ago, I started with, with Datafold. Um, uh, within those 10 years, my first primary focus was on technology. And uh, later on, uh, it became more on, on language, so more on semantics. And uh, uh, during those journey, I created a lot of automation tools because yeah, Datafold is uh, uh, kind of strict in the algorithm. So it's really a good uh, way of, uh, of automated. Um, um, back in 2019, I met Peter. Uh, we did our first uh, Datafold uh, Builder implementation together, and uh, it completed my vision on how to model and set up a data warehouse correctly. Uh, last year, I met uh, Marco. We were shared, uh, sharing our modeling thoughts. Uh, we combined those together with Datafold and Case Talk. So that's what this webinar is coming uh, from. I have uh, uh, a separation into my modeling. First of all, the definitions. And I will go to a data part. Um, my main thing is the, the topic, uh, top layer. It's a business object model uh, where I uh, model uh, from each perspective their own language. And uh, later on within these layers, I will integrate them. Now, within my modeling tool journey, uh, based on my modeling approach, uh, I came across a lot of the tools like Fisio Excel, and later on Enterprise Architect. Um, and uh, um, I created some yeah, algorithms, metadata-driven solutions. But uh, back in 2019, uh, well, whatever he said, I met Peter. So Datafold Builder uh, uh, came up my top mind. And um, we kind of could have generated in an easily way a Datafold. Last year, I met um, uh, Marco. Uh, and then my whole uh, definition part of modeling uh, 
uh, became to a reality. Uh, now we have combined these two and we would like to show you uh, in the next phase uh, how we did this. So, um, case talk, data for building. Marco, can I give the presentation further to, uh, to Jan? You can, yeah, you can try, or I will take it from you. Um, let's see how this works. I share my screen at this point. Um, <laughs> If I am correct, you will now see my presentation screen. So as I said in my introduction, um, I'm from KStalk and KStalk uh, supports an information modeling approach called fully communication oriented information modeling, uh, which, which, you know, like the name says, it focuses on the communication parts of data, uh, less so on technical aspects and um, in, in, in for the past 20 years, and even now, uh, we find ourselves in IT uh, um, with a couple of challenges. And um, it's nicely depicted that this image, it, it, we have silos everywhere. We have tons of source systems. We have departments. Uh, we have products. And everything seems isolated. And... and um, the approach with data vault, data vault builder is is to pull all that into one uh, new environment where we can start working with that data. Um, but we started with these silos, and and they um, produce a lost in translation effect. Now we have the business that's trying to talk with IT. IT tries to understand the business. Then you have the designers uh, that have to talk with the developers. And all along, you hope that the data is being processed in a way that it's meant to be processed. Um, whether that is data entry or data reporting or data processing, this data is moved from one place to another and, and it changes shape, uh, but actually it should re not really lose its meaning. And, and to make sure that it, it, it keeps its meaning, uh, we have to figure out how to communicate. And that's where KStop comes in with its uh, tool and, and approach. So um, just to be clear, this is the product. My name is Marco Wobber, and I'm a big fan of the business language first. And uh, what we're trying to approach with this method is, is that if the business communicates about their data, that we try to, as information modelers, try to capture their communication, uh, not necessarily the data, but their communication about the data. And uh, with the tool, and I'll demonstrate uh, in, in the various slides upcoming, that we can then generate all the artifacts that we need for IT production. And uh, in that way, we bring that communication all along to the end product, and that will then nearly perfectly aligned with the communication that the business had from the start. Now, there are a couple of stages that we need to go through because humans have a very informal way of communicating. Um, and we need to somehow formalize that a bit. And, and we do that by stating facts. Uh, if, if multiple people in the business side uh, state a fact and they agree, then that, that is considered to be an intersubjective fact or an objective fact and we're not going to go into the alternate facts in this case so um, i'm going to show you a slide that illustrates how that would work in a tool like case talk um, you see three little rectangles uh, one of them has all the text those are uh, business language about the data uh, expressed by business employees and um, then those statements contain business knowledge. And uh, it's not just an expression of the employee 465 perform checkup of patients 123499 on 12, 10, 2019 at 2 o'clock. But there is lots of information within that expression. And you see that depicted in this expression tree, as I will. Uh, we'll call it an information grammar can then be transformed or visualized in an information grammar diagram. Well, these are all jargon. 
uh, the most important message here is that you use the business language. You add the knowledge that is implied in that communication. And then we can have those building blocks graphically displayed. Now, capturing the business language is, is hard enough. Adding the knowledge to it, it requires expertise. And then that's just a starting point. There is a huge landscape in IT uh, that all depend on understanding the business. Uh, with KStock and its approach, we are basically in the top left corner where we talk with business, bis uh, get the business requirements and build this uh, elementary model. And with help of the tool, we can then transform that information model into, for instance, UML class diagrams, entity relationship diagrams, or relational models, generate database scripts out of it. Uh, if you're a web developer, you might want to need JSON files, XML schema definition files. Um, but even semantic web, uh, we can easily generate that out of this rich information model. Um, today, the, the focus is more on the data vault builder, builder integration. So instead of going through all these individual steps, we want to show uh, we want to show you how Peter would absorb uh, some of these data vault uh, scripts that come out of KStalk in the second part of the presentation. Now, to start talking with the business, I mean, it's, you really have to get into their way of communicating communicating, then uh, a very good approach would be the uh, scope and finding of concepts with the method called Ensemble Logical Modeling by Genesee Academy. Um, they invite the business uh, in various interviews and come up with these lists of what they call core business concepts. Um, we can identify the customer who is then tagged as a person. We have a sale, which is, which is earmarked as, as an event. And then we have additional forms that allow you to describe uh, what this concept customer is. Uh, we have a business definition. We have all kinds of attributes that come along in that communication. And we all capture that. Now, this is a sort of free format process. Uh, it's really thinking out of the box, trying to capture as much terminology as you can without really forcing you down to some sort of structure. With KStop, we can import those uh, documents and, and as you will see, it comes up with a beautiful list of terms. Uh, it, it, it can be visualized. It has all kinds of relationships and uh, it picks up on the business definitions. Um, but still, that is the visualization part of the initial gathering of concepts. And yes, there are some relationships, but it's really not, still not the actual communication about the data. And I'm gonna illustrate that with the following set of slides. We have a simple use case and uh, we write down in, in business language with real concrete examples, what would happen. Um, John has, has car trouble and he calls the help desk and, you know, there's a ticket created. And it goes through stages of, uh, okay, how do we uh, assess this ticket? Uh, somebody needs to approve it, then somebody is assigned to it as an engineer, et cetera, et cetera. So very simple example. And um, we're going to type out these expressions. Uh, and those are the input, really, for uh, case talk to start working with. Um, the driver, John, owns vehicle 2 to PZTV. And uh, we, like, like elementary school, it's like you underline the subject and the, and the verb, and, and it kind of resembles that methodology. Uh, we can underline certain parts or group parts of the text and, and classify them with new terminology. So the driver owns the vehicle. And the driver is communicated about as driver being a person, the vehicle with a license plate. And basically, um, we're, we're assessing the knowledge within this single fact expression from the business. And as I've shown you before, we can then graphically display that in a diagram because we all love pictures. Uh, 
of course, the tool works with a repository underneath, um, and it simply derives the visual information from the information that was put in. And already you see that a single expression can lead to a very rich information diagram. Let's start with the second expression. Uh, the support request. Uh, driver John requested support ticket 8899. And you will recognize that certain parts of the expression tree were already ended in the information model. So the tool really supports in reusing communication. And graphically, it then extends the information already put into a tool. And I'm going to just go through the next few statements and you can see how the information um, in that expression is being displayed and how that would extend the diagram. And again, all kinds of tool supports are in there to detect reverbalization different ways. Uh, so it does all kinds of pattern matching to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Specifically, if your model becomes big, like the five, 600 entities or over a thousand entities or 1500 entities or even way more, then you need this kind of support to make sure that you're building this high quality information model. And um, so it builds on to the information, it adds new statements. Uh, you can see there's very rich knowledge structures in these expressions by uh, looking at just the expression trees. And this is, this is really the key, because trying to get the business to communicate about their data, they might need a little training and how to verbalize that. They need to be instructed to say, okay, can you give me an example with whatever you're calling out right now? And then you have to go sit down and say, okay, is this the proper validation? So this, this communication part, the language part, really allows you to have engagement with the business. And um, finally, at the end of our scenario, uh, there is an engineer that actually handles that ticket. And, and then we have completed this little piece of information model. And we've grown from simple seven statements to a rich information model. All with uh, keeping track of the business language and keeping track of the examples provided. And then the tool really kicks in because then we can start pushing buttons to algorithmic model to model transformation. One of the examples is that from these seven fact expressions, we can generate an ERD schema. It comes with the tables, the columns, the foreign keys, the cardinalities, but it brings forward also the initial statements on type level or with all the examples populated. So this allows the business to actually, for the first time ever, validate an ERD scheme by just reading what it says. Similarly, uh, we do model-to-model uh, -model transformation for UML class diagrams. And you can see by the amount of graphical blocks that a UML transformation is not the same as an ERD transformation. And if you want to communicate with upper management, you know, they're really not into UML class diagram. Even an ERD can sometimes be a little compli complicated if they didn't have proper training. So they really want to see a high level picture. Um, so by leaving out some of the details and instead of attributes and columns introduce the business definition, a, a totally different diagram can be generated straight out of case talk. And uh, of course, we wouldn't be having a case tool like case talk uh, if we would not be able to also generate databases, uh, as mentioned before. And the beautiful part of that is that if we generate the tables, the, the columns and the relationships and all, the, all of that, we can still add database views on top of that so that we can query the database and extract the business communication that we started with. So that way we really have end-to-end -end, uh, support for communicating about data. Now, we're of course also interested in data fault builder because uh, having a system to be built to capture and process data is one thing, but then we also need to gather those uh, sources and pull them all together. And that's where Data Vault Builder comes in. So how about 
we use this same information model to then tell Data Vault Builder what are the core business concepts and what are the links, and if there are any, what are the satellites and reference tables, etc. So using the same diagram and overlaying it with a color code, you can now see that all the blue stuff is our, our typical hubs. And everything that is colored green is supposed to be a link in Data Vault Builder. It naturally comes from the communication with the business. Now, it doesn't stop there because there's all kinds of extra metadata that you might want to annotate uh, core business concepts or concept with product. I, I know it's just stored somewhere with an artificial key. Uh, it has time dependent components, so it needs state time, it needs transaction time. Certain data is, is sensitive for localization in multiple languages. Um, all kinds of annotations are possible on the information model in case stock, and it will drive the generation of artifacts and instructions. Now, case stock is built as a very rich fat client, so, uh, so to speak. Um, yet, yeah, it comes with uh, integration functionality. So, one of the things is that it supports multiple models, multi versions, multi users through a central repository. And on top of that repository, we've also built a portal which allows you to, to browse, find, navigate all of those versions and terms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it took a couple of screen prints from the browser. Uh, it comes with different models, uh, timelines. Uh, I can open up my one of my projects within the portal, and uh, I can see from that model that it has a certain version lineage uh, checked in. I can do difference uh, reporting on it, and. I can find my diagrams. I can have anybody navigate to the portal and find my ERD relationships or my concept maps. So all of this becomes instantly browsable uh, once your model's uh, being checked in into the version management system. And of course, the overview of all the terminology that went in there. And if we would, for instance, click uh, city in this case, we will then find the very detailed level of reporting uh, with the various tabs. I can go back to the communication parts. I can go to see all the different annotations out there. And having multiple models, having multiple versions, having information being reused between models, uh, we also need some sort of information tracking. So we support that we show these graph, nice little uh, graphs to, to show how information is used over various models. And all of this is currently being anonymized, but all of that comes with information and is clickable, et cetera, et cetera. And even the um, taxonomy over models uh, is, is properly managed and visible through the portal. Um, as I said in my introduction, case has been around for 20 years or nearly 20 years. Um, it's being used at various schools and universities uh, to, uh, to teach students uh, how to do information modeling, how to properly come with a database design, for instance. And uh, the, the critical thinking in that process of how do you talk to the business? How do you gather the requirements? all requires language. So this, this method developed in the 90s as uh, supported by Case Talk is very good at supporting you in a, in, a, in a stepwise approach to talking to the business. And uh, you may find more information online at casetalk.com. Um, now for the second part of the presentation, I am going to go back to one of our models that we quickly built and uh, besides doing all kinds of DBMSs, technologies, et cetera, et cetera, I'm just gonna open up my little file menu and go to my export capabilities and click Data Vault Builder option. And it will then use that information model, generate a set of Data Vault Builder instruction files, which, uh, Leading up to this presentation, I already sent to Peter, 
and I hope that Peter might now just take over the slides. So that was it, my talk for so far. Thank you a lot. So let me take over here. Good. So I would start first with a short introduction. What is the Data Vault Builder? Because we know we need to understand what we do with the model we receive. And the Data Vault Builder is a model-driven data warehouse automation tool. We believe as well, start with the model, start with the business terms, and generate the technology. And this helps us to bring in business users and IT together. Uh, okay, I need to, okay, like this. So you should see now my PowerPoint slides. And it helps us bring everybody together. First thing, collect the knowledge from your business users. They know how their business processes work to bring it in the data warehouse. And secondly, as well, include them in the build process so they understand what the technology side is doing, that they can accept it, that they can use it, and it gives a better outcome. For the backend people, it reduces the time to market because by automation, it means that we can integrate new data sources. We can change business rules and stuff very, very fast. And we will see that. I will start with the import of the model I have received. And then I will connect it with data and we will see what the outcome will be. Uh, just a little bit about us. We are located here in Switzerland. We're covering mainly the European market. We were growing in the past years as well to the US, to Australia. So we are present in different locations. We have as well, if you go in one of our detailed webinars, we will explain a little bit how do we compare against the competition, why we are top in the category time to market. We're very proud of that because this is one of our main focuses. It's about agility. It's about delivering business value very early on. Why? Because we need to validate as well these models we have designed. So you do all the modeling stuff, and you understand your business, then comes the data, and sometimes the data is not perfectly matching what your business processes should do. Because maybe the source system is not perfect, maybe the people operating a source system are not perfect, and we will see that in the live demonstration that sometimes even if the model is good, it doesn't match with reality. So we early on try to deliver the output so the business users can validate if it makes any sense. We have as well high customer satisfaction rates and good support quality. So this is a little bit our offering for our users. So what is the tool doing? And we have, <clears throat> we will see here what most of the automation tools do. They take a data model, that can be captured somewhere in the repository, it can be captured in files, and they translate it using patterns into working code. Working code can be database tables, it can be load procedures, it can be ETL procedures. The difference is that we are updating the technical implementation over time. We believe the model is the master, and if there's a new database version supporting new kind of indexes, if there are better ways to solve something because somebody came up with a new ID, that's cool. We will deliver you new patterns to transform your model into code. Plus, we deliver to our clients the update scripts. And that's really a big difference to other tools that just say, okay, you need to put in the patterns yourself and you're responsible for updating them because the data warehouse is not built like for a few weeks and then it's thrown away. It should live for several years and you need to ensure that your investment you do in the beginning in the model and in the tool is helping you to run your data warehouse for several years. Now, additionally to that, it is really important that you think about the whole development process. It's not just data modeling because we get again, uh, often the question, yeah, but we tried it with data modeling, but we don't see the value and the value is if you really can convert your data model into a working application with all the maintenance, with all the development processes, and that's what we're doing. So you can automate with the data vault builder as well the infrastructure to set up new environments. We're using technology used uh, called Docker, so you can run the data vault builder on premises, but as well in the cloud, you can set it up very easily just by configuration. If you complete it, the generation of your code, you need to test it. So we have REST APIs as well to do automatic regression testing. So you can set up a new environment, load your data model that you have, load your test data or your real data, run your processes, 
and check for the results if they match your expectations. If you complete the testing, then you like to deploy stuff. Deploying means that we recommend to have at least three different environments like described in the uh, ITIL standard. So you have development, test, and production environment. And the tool is comparing them and giving you deployment scripts to deploy certain features to the next environment. If you have more than three developers, like bigger installations, and you want to go really agile, we support as well the so-called Git flow-based process. So you can really branch your model, develop your features, add some loads so different developers work on different topics, and then you can merge everything back together. If you have done this manually, at some point you get hopefully tired of this because if you're working agile, you deploy every two weeks, maybe even every week. We have customers de de deploying every day. Then you want to automate that. So there are REST APIs as well to that, comparing environments, deploying stuff, giving you automated result feedback that you can use with different tools. If you deployed everything up to your test environment or user acceptance environment, then you want to run your stuff automatically as here well here that's included in the tool. It includes a scheduler. It does parallelization automatically. And you can schedule your jobs in the tool, but as it offers REST APIs as well from the outside world. So if you have an enterprise scheduler, that will work out as well. And at the end, when you're finished with your testing, you want to maybe check for high availability of your loads and data queries. This works out as well. We can give you the corresponding patterns. This means it's really taking care of all the steps that you need to build, deploy, and operate your data warehouse. And the point is really, don't think just about this first step when you're evaluating solutions because this here will hit you later, but it will hit you if you're getting into fully fledged data warehouse, which is integrating your data. So what do we do layer-wise? Just to give you a very simplified point of view, we have some data sources, we load them into our integrated core. Our integrated core is always modeled in data vault format. That's the technical implementation, how we do it. But it's disconnected from the model. You have seen you can model in case talk, however you want, present your models as, like it, uh, as you like it, and then we convert it here for the technical implementation into data vault style. This helps us to become really agile. It helps us that we can start developing a different end of the data model without knowing the full enterprise data model in the beginning, and we are sure that everything will grow together at the point where we extend the model. The point is, accessing the data in data vault format is a really bad idea. It was already in turn normal form, but here we have even more normalization. We have more tables, some more joints to write. So we need to create an interface and that's what the data vault builder is well doing. So we select up to which level we want to denormalize the model. Very often it's a dimensional model. We are outputting the stuff like for applications like Click, Click, Tableau, or Power BI. It could be more normalized, maybe for Cognos, sub-business objects, or it could be super flat tables if you have people using like Python scripts, data frames in there, and just want to get a completely denormalized output. That's possible. So we're having these two functions storing the data in data vault format, outputting it as it is needed. And we're running on top of supported databases. Why only? A handful of databases are supported is because we're optimizing our SQL code for this kind of platforms. And here now, case talk comes in. So instead of creating the model within the data vault builder, I can import the data model that was created with this approach in case talk and let generate the object. Uh, maybe here, one question in between, how does the data vault builder compare to other tools? It's, we are very, very standardized. So we are having, we are built on the data vault standard. So you have to have a data vault core here and you have a limited kind of freedom that you can't create whatever kind of data warehouse process you want to create because we have one proven tested process, but the advantages we deliver you and that's a in comparison to other tools, we are delivering you already the conversion scripts 
Plus, we are delivering you the updates, so we are maintaining much more. We're taking care of parallelization, so it's really one product covering the full process, and you will probably not find this in this combination in any other tool. So let's get a little bit more technical before we go in the live demonstration. So which kind of levels, uh, stages do we support? So we have here the staging layer that can connect to your source system. That's maybe as well a difference to other tools we have built in ELT capabilities to connect to source data, stage the data in here. And this is probably the same for data vault modeling, turn normal form modeling and Kimball style data warehouses. But from here, instead of going directly to the dimensional model and needing to change the history and everything in here, if something changes in our data model, we are having a core. So that's more similar than a turn normal form approach, but in contrast to an Inman approach, we are not applying any business rules here. We are storing the data as it is. We are creating a unique source of facts and then applying denormalization and rules on top of that. And this prevents that if we implement any business rules the wrong way that we need to reload data, it makes us much more agile because changing here the virtual layers is much more faster. The downside is we're creating more technical objects here, like tables, views, and stuff like that. But that's not a problem because that's model driven. So we are generating all of this. So we are mitigating the problem that Data Vault uh, has by its design. Our uh, Azure SQL databases as well supported, yes, uh, managed instances, but as well Azure SQL is supported as well. In the meantime, Synapse is supported. So yes, all the Microsoft stack of databases should be generally supported. Good. And the Data Vault Builder was always built from the beginning in mind that everything that we are doing has its own APIs so we can integrate it with whatever tools are on the market. And here as well, we're talking about the case talk implementation. So Marco already designed a model. He created a special format that we can read. It's our deployment format that we use as well to deploy code between our environments. It's perfectly fitting in our deployment module. And this is my start point that I will use to do the live demonstration. So let me switch over to my demo environment. <clears throat> Just checking the questions in between. What will be checked in into Git if we are working with the Data Vault Builder? And I can show you that because it, this is as well what will be my starting point for my import. It's the logical description of what the data warehouse should be. It's not the technical implementation. We don't believe the technical implementation over time is stable. It is the model. So what I received from case talk is a description for all the layers and I got a list of hubs. We see here that we have here like student, a graduate, a apprenticeship, and we can maybe look as well into the hub object itself. And if you look at the file, this is a logical description of this core business concept that will become a hub here. And this is what we check in into our Git repository because this is stable over time. It is human readable. It is separated into small blocks of files. So we really see in the Git process if new objects were added, if objects were removed, or if objects were changed. So it's really in a format that models can be branched and merged in Git. And even many tools claim to support Git, they don't do it in this way that you really can work with it very dynamically. So let's see what happens. So let's go to the deployment module and just maybe to say what, what I'm starting with, I have completely cleaned out Data Vault Builder. It's a browser-based interface for a server-based application. And now I will decide to import the files I have received.
So I just drag and drop here the folder. And now it compares the model as I have received it with my current implementation. And because my current implementation is an empty environment, it shows me that everything needs to be created. So we see again the comparison from what we have seen in the file that there should be some new stuff created. There will be even a load created. There will be a first name and last name that will create a business key. This was already captured everything in case talk. So we don't need to recreate this kind of information here if you already captured it before. So for the time being, I select to import everything and let's start it. <coughs> and if we go to our core module, we see now that this module, um, this model is appearing here. So again, we see a different representation, but the same model here that we had before. So we have the student, the graduate and the apprenticeship. And if I click on the student, we see even that already the data load was defined. So it's coming from a table called student. It has a first and last name as a business key. And in our staging module as well, the matching staging table was already designed to pull in the data. Now let's try that. Now let's test it with data. So we change now in the data driven perspective. That's really what is strong in the data vault builder that you have this two point of views. So let's have a look on the student file. And I have shortened it here that we really see some essential information in here. We have only a few lines in here. So we have several students. I <coughs> enrolled here in this university some years ago. We have a Hans Master, which is Hans example, and Mike Miller. And we see that Mike Miller is already several times in our student file. And that's a little bit confusing. So let's have a look at it. Test if our load into our data vault core could be working. Let's try to load that. And it will turn out this doesn't work out because the business key that was defined and should be maybe the first and the last name in the first version is not unique. Um, so we get the error message. This is not matching our expectations. So let's look at an example. And what do we see here is that there are three duplicates of Mike Miller. The tool supports us to detect them and shows us that these three lines are identical. So that doesn't work out. So let's have a look and now use the data vault builders capabilities. And we look into the staging table and the data vault builder detects that in the source file, there are some more additional columns than what we received so far from the model. So I add them here that I wanna stage them as well. And let's load them here. And let's see if this helps us. So let's look at the data. And here we now see that yes, this three Mike Millers that we have here, two of them enrolled in a different year and oh yes, they have a different student ID. So it looks that people with the same name can enroll at the same university, makes business-wise perfect sense. If we show this to the business users, they probably understand and say, yeah, okay, it makes sense we should improve our model and maybe they come, come up with the idea that the student ID could be now the better key. And here, the data vault builder is supporting you when you're testing your data. So let's say we we'll want to load the student. Let's take the student ID and here, before we go on and recreate this kind of process, it gives us a feedback that no, the student ID is not unique. So what the hell is going on? But if you look at the data, we see it. We have here two different names. So it looks like they're reusing the student ID. If one student completes his, his university degree, they are reusing it as several years later. So it looks like at this university, not that it's a good idea, you need to take the immatriculation year and the student ID and this combination gives you now the right key. And if we get this, everything else can be automated by the tool. So now we have taken a model, we have, fix the load, and now we have a production ready implementation to load our data. It's creating the so-called hub load, a list of keys. It's creating a satellite load, which is a list of the attributes, including their history. So it's doing fully STD type two uh, historization on top of it. And very important is this part of data world was automated already by many tools, but we are automating the full process. It means 
that even creating an output interface is included in here. So I can create a new object. And here I go more into Kimball thinking. So what is the grain of my output? And maybe I take here as was view, I can decide that it could be a SCD type one or two output. So just the as of now view or as of then view. So all this kind of temporality and which makes it really difficult to, to handle certain type of loads and queries is already built in into the tool and automated. So let's take this as a as is view. And now here we can visually select from the different elements which kind of columns we want to output. We can rename the columns and everything just nicely visually. And the big advantage is that these layers are virtual. We don't need to reload any data. If we do any changes here, we can test it right away as soon as it's saved. And we see the output as it will be delivered to the reporting tool. So the only step is here, if we don't want to add any business rules yet, we can just publish it. And that's it. That's how long it takes from a data model to get imported connected with some source data, validate the loads, execute the loads are now really production ready and create an interface for your reporting application and decide that you want to publish it without business rules. And that's really the most simple way to present your data. That's the kind of time to market you have to expect if you just want to get a first version out. It will maybe take longer to understand the data and everything. Yes, for sure, it's not a magic bullet, but it helps you to automate all the technical steps. In the background, it created already a data lineage. So we could now filter now for what is happening here. We have the source system, the staging table. We have the elements that we have imported. We have the denormalization view. We have the business rules, not doing anything yet, and the output. As well, in the operations module, a job was created to load all this kind of files in the right order, to load the elements in the core. You see some other load for apprenticeship was imported from the case talk model we had. So we have already here some working elements. They're running in the right order. I could schedule them in here. We have really production ready implementation. As well, the documentation, we need to generate one because never before one was generated and it goes down even to the column level showing you the different objects. It gives you model excerpts so that you can as well, if you print it out, understand how the elements are related and it goes through all the layers up to the output. So I could go and say, yeah, I'm happy with it. And now I have two options. Either I connect to my next environment, like if this would be my development environment to my test environment, sync the, the model and deploy it there. That would be the simplified deployment, or I could export the description in a logical format of my current implementation and check it into Git on my own branch and then ask for pull requests to my colleague that will merge then my changes into the integrated dev branch on Git. So that was already some technical stuff here, but you see the, how the flow works and how we can really work together. And then it's really a click of a button. So let's go back. My PowerPoint question uh, presentation and let's ask, are there any open questions that Mark or Ron or I shall answer. I see one question by Michiel. It says, in Data Vault Builder, you are arranging the business key, but this was imported from KStock. How are the changes fed back into KStock? Um, <coughs> I'll answer that one, if you will, Peter. <laughs> yeah. um, so what I found interesting is that uh, clearly the information model, uh, of course, this is a simple a scenario, uh, 
obviously in the, in the scenario that was laid out here, there has been a gap between what the source data and how it identifies a student versus how the business told me as an information modeler how to identify a student. So uh, there is a clearly a communication gap between the data and how the business talks about the data. And uh, in the discovery process, so beautifully supported by Data Vault Builder, we learn that the names are not unique at all. So uh, again, discovery, discovery, discovery. It's like, oh, wait a minute, we identify students by year and number. So we need to go back to the business with that information to check, hey, uh, we found this through Data Vault Builder uh, analysis on one of our source systems. How does that affect your communication about data? And uh, that's really the process that we, we need to support instead of just reporting back with technical differences because there might be a second, third and fourth system that uses different annotations as well. So all of that is part of the uh, lost in translation effect with all the silos. We need to go back to the business and ask, is this correct or how do you want to communicate it properly? And then we can adjust the information model and redeploy uh, specifications for Data Vault Builder to continue the exploration and creation and filling of data vaults. There's a question, do you need schedule from Data Vault Builder? I'm not 100% sure if I understand the question, but the master jobs loading one source system are created automatically. You can schedule them in the tools. There's a built-in scheduler or there is a REST API if you have like Chronicle, Control M or UC4 or any other external scheduler that can trigger a job and then you can receive uh, the status if it was successful or not through a REST API. Has this solution been tested with any MPP? Uh, yes, <laughs> the biggest uh, growth we have currently is on MPP systems today. A lot of Snowflake clients are joining us to, to use Data Vault Builder on Snowflake. And we have there several clients with load up to billion of rows in one batch size. It always depends on how big do you scale your MPP system. We have done tests which can load several, like six or seven billion of rows within a few minutes into your data warehouse. But you need to scale your MPP system in the size that it becomes very expensive. So the question is always what are really your requirements? I'm pretty sure that with the database technologies we have today and, and analytically based databases like Synapse, like XSL, like Snowflake, that you will manage to load your data. The question is more, what is the price for it? So you need to really see what are your requirements? What's your window for loading the data? What is the window for querying your data? But generally, yes, it's tested and we can show you the different of possibilities for that. Then one question for you are taking, I think from when will it be available in the software products? Yes, I'll, I'll uh, that's the question by Roy, when, yes. Um, well, currently we're doing some, some testing and trials still with, uh, between KStock and Data Vault Builder. Um, but you're, you're, <coughs> as you've seen, it's, it's ready to be taken in by Data Vault Builder and we would welcome you to join in with the testing to, and, and uh, further uh, development of, of required features. But um, so it might actually be readily available anytime soon. Um, and uh, it really depends on our first uh, actual user uh, that has the Data Vault Builder environment, has the case of licenses to, to see how that would uh, uh, fuse. Um, and in regards to the follow-up question is that, how is it licensed? Uh, again, we have uh, different licensing models. Uh, it's all subscription-based. Uh, we have we have free editions, we have educational editions, uh, personal, professional, even all the way up to enterprise uh, editions. So, um, as we're looking at it now, we're probably going to deploy the Data Vault Builder facilities with the enterprise edition. Um, so that's 
And from our side as well, a subscription-based system. And there are two main drivers. The one is the sizing of your production database. And it really depends on which database technology you're using, what the, what the different tiers are, plus the number of developers. We are not charging any money for test or development systems because we, we believe you should do a proper ITIL conform development process. And, and many companies didn't do that if you charge for test systems. So you just have one price for everything. It covers it. You can use the Git flow based process, whatever you like, as many sandboxes, integration service, what you need just to set up a proper development process. Um, I can see. I mean, I see more questions. Uh, Stefan Lawrence, do you need a better tester? Winky face. Well, sure. Join in, uh, Stefan. <laughs> uh, just reach out and uh, we'll set something up. Um, and then there's, there's still uh, one, one more open question about the Azure Data Lake storage Gen2 as a source by Alex. Can you read the question, Ron? Uh, is it possible to have an Azure Data Lake storage Gen2 as a source, especially with hierarchical namespaces, I think as a source for Dataful Builder? Yes, we had that in a POC a few weeks ago, so I know what, what he's referring to. Yes, it is. We are using RGRPC connector for that, where you can use Python scripts to connect to whatever data you want. So you can add as well some custom code if you need to move the files around or rearrange them or filter them or load them in a specific order. So it needs a few lines of Python code as well to, to add this additional logic. But generally, if it's referring to like loading the parquet files from the, that, that, that is possible. Okay. And there's, there's a question from Greg. Uh, I see Data Vault Builder has a cloud offering. Will KStock integrate with that solution also? Uh, question mark. Uh, to to be honest, to me, this is a question mark too, because um, as as uh, Peter has shown in his demo, is that we uh, focused on the model to um, specification transformation from KStock uh, to see if it would match uh, the integration points in Data Vault Builder at this point. And um, I know that Data Vault Builder has a, a, um, a cloud API to communicate with that, but we haven't, I, at least I haven't explored it yet. So maybe Peter would like to address that, Adam. The Data Vault Builder itself, it can run on premises or in the cloud and on every system you have a fully fledged REST API that you can connect to from everywhere. So even if you have a fat client okay. with some application and they can talk to, to API, to REST APIs, using a, a authentication bureau, it shouldn't be an issue from our side because we're transparent. You just need to make it reachable from the location where you are, so that's fine. But yes, the, the, the client talking to, to the data vault building needs to be able to support this kind of technology. Okay, well, it shouldn't be too hard. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I'm looking at the time. Um, I would really want to thank our main speakers, Mark and Peter, for this enlightening presentation. Um, if there are any more questions, please address them to uh, the three of us. Uh, keep in contact by uh, LinkedIn. And uh, thank you all for attending. Very, very well. Thank you as well. And if there are any open questions, don't worry. We, we see them. We will uh, come back to you through LinkedIn or email and, and. Yes. Yes. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. See you next time.